of people who are just starting to come in and join. Hi Vincent, hi Beth Morris, hi Nasca, hi Juliet, hi Casa, hi Volley Design, Karen Hall Textile Artist. Hello everybody, so people are just starting to come in. So welcome everybody who's just starting to join. We're just waiting for our guest, Nuno, to join us. She will be here any second. No. Hi, Sandra. It's lots of waves. Thank you, everybody, for the waves. Who else have we got? We've got um, Plamu Art Centre. Not sure where that one is. Jess Timmy's art. Hi Jess. Hi Nuno. So Nuno should be joining us in a second. We're just waiting for Nino to come in now. Hello! Hello! Hey, you made it! I didn't make it. Sorry, my phone was acting up a little bit. No, don't worry, we're not. We're only on uh, 629 at the moment, so oh, perfect. we're absolutely fine. So if you want to settle yourself down, people are still coming in, so we're absolutely fine. Perfect. Who else have we got coming in? Mira. Erna, Tina, Atkinson, Thomas, getting lots of people coming. Hello, Scott. Uh, let us know when you're on down. Hi, Eleanor. So there's lots of people starting to come in. Now, can you hear me all right, Nuno? I can hear you really well. Thank sure. You. I've got, there's a little bit of feedback. Are you hearing it or is it okay for you? It's got a little bit of feedback, but it's, it's nothing. Nothing oh, that's got money at all. So just to start and draw an elevator, I can feel the full. Can you give me the thumbs up if you think it sounds okay? Yeah. It might be that it's worse my end. It's quite scratchy for me. But does it sound all right? Does it sound all right? Oh, nobody's coming back to me. Okay, should we start anyway? I think um, I'll just ignore it. It's not it's, if, if you're all right. If you can't hear it, then it must be my end. So I'm fine. that's absolutely fine. Okay, so it is it's thirty, and my name's Kate, and I am the director of the Big Draw, and we do a Instagram live in drawn conversation with session probably about every other week, and. Well, we're, we're delighted because they've proved to be quite popular. We started them off over lockdown and they've, they've continued. And, and this week, it's my great pleasure to invite Nuno de Costa in, who will he'll introduce himself in a second. Um, and then I can just sort of make, start to tell everybody about how, well, how I found out about you, Nuno. And obviously, I started to stalk you and want to talk to you and, and all that. So <laughs> we can get on to that. But um, I want to do a quick, a quick introduction to yourself in your own words. Who you are and what you do. Uh, my name is Nino da Costa and I'm a, a fashion and beauty artist, uh, illustrator, image creator. Um, and I create hopefully beautiful images. <laughs> you definitely do. Oh, thank you. You definitely do. Thank you. So, I mean, the, the, the way, I mean, you know this already, Nino, but the way that I first found out about your work, so... I was, it was basically, I was looking at my notes, I made a few notes, so I I found out about FIDA, I didn't know about FIDA before, yes. so for people who are who are on the call who don't know, so FIDA it stands for Fashion Illustration and Drawing Awards, obviously set up by Pat, Patrick Morgan, um, really, really interesting organisation, I thought, gosh, that's so interesting, it's bringing together illustration and drawing and fashion and design, and mark making, um, all the things that we, we talk about at the big draw. And I'm always very mindful at the big draw that we don't, I don't think, we do enough in terms of shining a light on 
drawing and illustration in, in fashion. So I, I hope this will be um, the beginning of many more of these sorts of conversations with people who are working in the industry because it, it's drawing and, and mark making illustration are so key. And what, the reason I came across you it was actually it was a, it was a an article on the feed website. It was called "Why Fashion Illustration Matters in the Digital Age." And it was so interesting because I thought it was getting a whole conversation around, I suppose, drawing, illustration, that, not necessarily over photography, but as an alternative, or perhaps in together, you know, doing it together. Um, and the quote that I thought, this is really interesting, was, fashion starts from a drawing, Vogue started as an illustrated magazine. And that was by Ferdinando Federi, the creative director of Vogue Italia. And I thought, well, absolutely. I, mean, I didn't actually know that Vogue started as an illustrated magazine until I read that article. But And it was from there that I started to then have a look around all the different illustrators and, and what they'd done and what Vogue had done. And I think it'd be a lovely place to start because basically you were, when you, you were one of a very handful of select individuals invited by, by Vogue, different, I think different Vogues in different countries, to go on the front cover. Yeah. which is it's quite extraordinary really so can we if i can pass over to you that was that was where i got wind of your work and you so if i can pass over to you for a little bit to tell us a bit more about that well that had kind of um i started working for vogue portugal uh, when they relaunched in 2017 yeah. and uh it had been um taken over by a new publishing house a younger publishing house who's uh, more bespoke mm. and so I'd started working with them in 2017 on their second issue. And then early in January, I think it was, the fashion, uh, not the fashion, the actual editor-in-chief had invited me to participate in uh, a special edition which was being made for the Condé Nast uh, Luxury Conference. And so basically she had uh, invited 10 photographers that was the initial concept to create their concept of what luxury meant to them in, yeah. in this new world that we're living in. And, and she had actually decided to only use nine photographers and had invited me to create the second, the, the tenth fashion story. So I initially had no actual idea that it was going to be used for the cover. It, I, I wasn't commissioned to create a cover. It was just. You were one of ten. You didn't know where you'd end up. Yeah, exactly. And, and generally when you work, for fashion magazines, unless you're working with a celebrity, you don't really know that you're going to get a cover. Um, mm. so they're not really commissioned that way. The covers are normally selected from uh, <clears throat> from the context of the of the magazine. So if they find a, an image that they appreciate, then that ends up on the cover. Mm. And I got a call one day to say, "I think you're going to like the cover that's going to come out." <laughs> Some very nice comments coming through already. Someone just said, Nuno is the premier fashion artist of the moment. He captures the zeitgeist effortlessly. Gosh. Wow. Very nice. I think so. That is. Ferrero Studio, that one. You're getting lots of hearts as well coming up on, on the screen. It, I, mean, I think it's, it's interesting. And do you think that, um, do you think that other, are you seeing more of this? I mean, are you seeing more fashion houses and are they starting to maybe go back a bit to drawing and illustration to help animate their collections rather than just relying on photography, do you think? Is there a bit of a trend there? Uh, I think, yes, definitely there is. I, th I think... I think... Uh, you know, it's never going to really compete with uh, fashion photography, but it's, it's seen as a nice kind of complement to it. Right. And I think we're so inundated with fashion photography um i think if you open a magazine it's just image after image mm. uh things can it's like sort of differentiate isn't it it does make them stand out from from the pack a hand illustrated image definitely it definitely does and it kind of kind of creates a space to breathe uh within within the context of a you know a sea of fashion photography yeah. it's kind of it's kind of a nice pause and a nice kind of, it can be an exclamation point as well on, on something that stands out. Um, but I think uh, that's kind of, 
really uh, there's a fashion illustrator called David Downton who who um, kind of gave new life to to fashion illustration as an art form because uh, as you previously mentioned it was uh, Vogue's were all illustrated because they started in the 1800s and then when uh, photography uh, was invented yeah. it kind of transition to that so sadly a lot of illustration was yeah. lost and there were a few amazing illustrators that kept on working yeah um, but it kind of had really died out as an art form and then you know illustrators like Jason Brooks and, and David Downton uh, who it's so interesting amazing. isn't it really I mean I I know that I mean obviously I'm biased it's a big draw, drawing but I think for me I mean looking at your images but I mean look just looking at images at fashion illustration generally there's something for me about the immediacy of the way that yes. the drawn line captures the what do I it sounds a bit the, the essence of work. I don't I it captures the movement, the dynamism certainly in the outfits and the clothing. I think it captures that for me. It's personally it captures that better than photography. It captures something of that of the, the movement. You don't get the still still image. Um, definitely and I think what fashion illustration really allows uh, allows for is to let the viewer kind of fill in the blanks fill in the gaps. So you, you, yeah. you know so the viewer to a certain respect it's more participatory yeah so in, in a certain respect the viewer will see what they want to see in the image yeah whereas in a, a photograph it's all laid out there like really you can't yeah. it is what it is really yeah. so i, I think, think that's it so, sorry i totally agree and it, it, it minds it reminds me a lot of a conversation, one of these sorts of conversations I had with somebody a few months ago, and he is, well, he's an illustrator, but he tends to do, um, he tends to do reportage at uh, sports events, at football and stadiums and that. Uh, and he was saying, obviously, he'd been different in COVID, but, but pre-COVID, he'd noticed quite a big upsurge in his work. So a little bit like you were saying, that people weren't necessarily bringing all the photographers into doing it. They wanted something a bit different. And they were bringing yeah. in, and he, and he kept finding himself being sent to these massive stadiums because the, the sort of the movement, that dynamism that get, you get with doing a quick sketch or drawing, capturing the, the motion of, and the action, and I suppose the energy of the footballers or the sport was yeah. better captured in the drawings than necessarily the photos that are very, very static. Uh, yeah, indeed, that energy is kind of, uh, you know, I, I say as an illustrator very often that. Every time I, I create something, I leave a little bit of myself on the page. And it, it can actually, which is going to sound a bit woo-woo, but, you know, it can be quite a draining process as well, you know, and you can feel like after you've it's done a lot of it, yeah. Yeah, it kind yeah. of, you can feel a bit kind of, oh, like depleted after you've done it. And it is literally because you've just laid it out there on the page. Yeah. Well, I'd really like to come back to that, because that's something we've touched on when we chatted previously about how much time these things they may look you know beautifully effortless and all the rest of it but obviously it's not quite like yeah. that um so it'd be great to come back to that i mean is it fair to say that drawing is quite important to you in your life you know plays a, a key role yeah. for you it really is it's a huge part of who i am as a person you know it's i, I think it'd be quite difficult to separate the two and not to be too dramatic about it but i think it's this is, I, don't, I don't know, it's going to sound a little bit pretentious, but I really feel I was born to do what I do. Yeah. And so to, to, to kind of separate the person from the art, I think is super... And you draw every day? Yeah, I've been drawing every day since I was like three years old. Yeah. So, yeah, so should we go back to that then? I, I mean, I wanted to just bring the uh, people on the call in at a point where sort of I had come across your work and it really was coming in from that, finding out about Feeder and the article, and then a whole world, and I was thinking, wow, look at this, this is incredible. Um, that was where I started with, with it, with you. But So if we go back, I mean, because, I mean, one of the things to say uh, for people listening to the call is that you're, you're self-taught, for a start, yes. and, you know, you've not necessarily come through that sort of um, well-worn journey of traditional arts school, go on to the right places, do the right courses, get the right gigs. You've had a slightly yeah. different experience and route in, haven't you? Oh yeah, definitely. I, uh, but I mean, starting actually... when you were little, you see, you know, drawing and, and sketching and making just from from the age of three, that creativity, that wanting to do something with your hands. Yes, definitely. I think I think if you give most 
toddlers like a pencil, like their first instinct is to mark something with it, whether it's a wall or a couch yeah. or a piece of paper, you know, that instinct is there. It totally and, is. Uh, it is, isn't it? And, yeah. Uh, Sorry, I just got, I'm just smiling because you've got some funny comments. You've got somebody saying, I was going to say he's been drawing since he can remember from Matilius. Um, yes. And then there's somebody comes. underneath saying, you know, you're so handsome. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> well, that's very nice for Raro Studio. Um, yes. So I, I recognise that whole thing about when you're, when you're little. I, well, something I used to do when I was little was um, hide behind furniture. And then the bit that wasn't visible, I draw and I'd scribble. And I think I used to put bogeys and things on it, actually, probably disgusting stuff <laughs> as well. But it was basically, I would cover it and they'd pull the, they'd pull the, there was like this table, it had like a really low front, you'd fold down. And I remember going, it's like a den. I remember when we moved, they pulled it away and there wasn't a scrap of wall left. Wow. You know, everything had, was covered and everything inside on the wood was covered and probably wow. disgusting, you know, to horrible streets and things as well. But yes, it was, it's that ha wanting to cover, cover the, the, yeah. the space, isn't it, creatively, and, and do something with your hands. Yeah, definitely. I think there's something quite primal about it, but um, yeah. it's funny you mentioned the furniture because I was always under a table, like cutting up little bits of paper. And yeah. I remember my nan always being annoyed. I kept on finding little triangles of paper <laughs> lying around the house. Um, so yeah, but I've I've always been drawing and from a really early age and and like one of the stories my mum likes to tell is that when I was about four years old there was a a fashion show on the TV and it was a Valentino fashion show and there was a model walking on the catwalk in a red dress and I drew her obviously not very well but uh well don't say that I you know you probably <laughs> you probably did draw it well. Ooh, yeah, but, yes. But no. you remember it. The point is that you were little, and it it stuck in your mind. It was significant to you at the time. It was interesting. Definitely. Yeah, it? definitely. It was. Uh, I remember just being totally transfixed by it, and it was just so alien to anything else I had seen on the television. I think. Yeah. Um. So I was like captured by that. Yeah. And I well, suppose that's a feeling that you keep on chasing. I suppose. Yeah. Well, I think when we spoke before, I think. I mean, you're basically doing, what, doing my dream job. I mean, when I was little, I had decided that I was going to have a dual career. And half of me was going to be a barrister because I like to pick oh, a God. fight. You know, I like to, you know, verbally. It's like, yeah, I can have a bit of a verbal scrap. Stand oh, up to people. Them. You know, revolution. Oh, and I, I thought, believe I did, them. And I thought it paid well. So I thought, I'll do half of that. And then the other half of me I wanted to do was, um, which thought what we all did when I was, because I'm so old, we didn't have any of the stuff that kids have now that my girls have got. So, you know, it was all done on, it was all done on, on paper. You know, we'd do the designs, we'd draw out the little dolly, we'd put the little tabs, yeah. we'd cut the tabs out and we'd fold it over. And we'd make yeah. the different outfits to fit around the dolly. Um, I mean, very low tech, but it was fun. And I used to think, oh, God, I wish I could do this when I was older. I didn't do it. So, I, you know, I'm really in awe of, of people like you who have been able to sort of take that and, and make a very successful and creative and enjoyable career out of it. You know, it's inspiring. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. We've got well, some that, comments that's... here as well. Uh, so Sandra said, miss those programs like the clothes show. Yeah. yeah Wonderful that Fashion Illustrator is about gaining attention that Nino is at the forefront of that. It's about time. Oh, that's very sweet. Yeah, you're getting a lot of love on the call, aren't you? That, yeah, that's very nice. Thank you. I appreciate it. So, so we, should we pick up this? So you've, you've been little. You've scribbled all over the walls and the furniture. Like, wow. yeah. And you've yeah. got a bit bigger, and they're starting to say to you at secondary school, OK, come on, Nino. What are you going to do with your life? What happens next? Do you know, like, when I was in primary school, I remember being told I was never academic. And they actually, my parents came home from, from parent evening one day and they said that the teacher told them, oh, you know, he's always going to be really bad academically, but at least he can draw. <laughs> and I think that must have really marked me yeah. because um, I actually didn't end up applying for any university. I just didn't see myself in that world, um, either academically or for arts either. Um, and then... I ended up getting really amazing grades for A-level, but I hadn't applied anywhere. 
And then I was advised to apply to King's College. So I applied to King's College, which was super difficult to get into. And I managed to con them into letting me in. <laughs> so I went and studied uh, languages and Latin American, Hispanic cultural studies. And it was just totally the wrong thing. I absolutely hated it. It was just, even physically and psychologically, you know, my, even my body started telling me, oh my God, you've made the wrong decision. Yeah. And it was just like a really kind of a, a depressing point, you know, and I was starting to process the fact that I wasn't enjoying the studies and I was thinking, oh my God, if you're not enjoying the studies, you're not going to enjoy the career that's going to come after those studies. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I left, I actually decided to explore my love of art and a friend of mine had actually taken me to, um, to the Fig Gallery in London, which is a fashion illustration gallery, mm -hmm. and that's in London. And they, they had an exhibit uh, on fashion illustrators. And there was a book that accompanied it called Fashion Illustration Now, and, and that's when all the pieces kind of clicked into place. And I was like, wow, there's, you know, there's actually a career that can come from all the bits and pieces that I loved. You know, yeah. if you merge them all together, you, you can actually have a, a career out of it. And there are people who are actually doing it. Yeah. And being successful at it and kind of living their best life. And I thought, that's that's the job for me. Mm. And um, it was quite funny because I never, you know, I'd always assume drawing women. I was always kind of really transfixed by artists like uh, Gustave Klimt and and Yvonne Sheila and, yeah. and Alphonse Mucha and Tamara de Lendigo, all, all these amazing artists. And I'd always kind of And they also have very beautiful, fluid drawn lines on all of the artists that you've, you've talked about. There's a, a lovely yeah. fluid to the line, isn't it? Definitely. And their representation of women, like the woman was always in control, which was something that I loved. You know, she was, she was always beautiful, but she, she was her own person. Mm. Um, and she represented beauty in, in kind of many different forms, in dark and in light. And I found that really beautiful. Um, but I'd, so I'd kind of always associated drawing women with fine art for some reason. And it wasn't until I'd gone to this exhibit that I realised there was a, a commercial aspect yeah. uh, that could come into play, and, and especially with the fashion. Um, so I created a portfolio and then I, I just phoned up lots of magazines. And... Yeah, and then I got an appointment with an art director for a magazine called More, which was, uh, was a huge teen magazine in London, probably one of the biggest selling magazines in London, uh, in the UK, and and they were kind enough to see me and to book me. I went to see the art director, and he said, "Oh, I think we should speak to the to the fashion director." So I went to see Wendy Rigg, who's an amazing lady, and, and she looked at my portfolio, which was about that thick full of gouache paintings. And she, I think she just picked up on my passion for it. And then she booked me to do, a, I think it was a, six pages of fashion illustrations for a fashion special that they were doing for the March issue, which was kind of a really big coup. So I started working really quickly within like a week. It was like, I mean, that is amazing. Business. That is amazing. I mean, there's, I mean, there's a couple of points with, with all of that that I was really keen to unpack. I mean, the first bit, it, which I have to say, unfortunately, is something that we hear on a weekly basis at the Big Draw, is this idea of one's younger self not being encouraged to do something, um, you know, creative in, in, in formal learning education. So whether it's a primary or secondary school, you know, quite often it can go either way. You know, it can be like a shit teacher, somebody that totally just takes the confidence away from the child um, mm. at a time when they should be surely encouraging and building them up. Or the opposite, that there's been that one teacher that has, you know, stepped forward, perhaps against the odds, perhaps when the school hasn't had a particularly good creative offer and said, you know what, this child's got ability, they're passionate, they want to do something with their hands, they're really bright, you know, mm. the intelligence comes in all sorts of different ways. Let's support this child to get do what they want to do and you hear that as well and i unfortunately not, not quite quite as often um yeah. but it, it, it's, it's such a shame it's just such a shame that so many people have had these and i just i mean we i think teachers do such an amazing job and they work so hard i don't want to certainly don't want to be dissing teachers on the floor but i hope things have changed i hope things have changed i mean i still do hear these things now unfortunately yeah. even within the current um education set up and obviously there is still unfortunately not parity with creative subjects 
plain STEM subjects like technology, engineering, math. There's not. They are still pushed down the list, unfortunately, which is such a shame because it's, well, it's, you know, it's, it's putting kids in, in a box at a very early age and, and, and labeling them and saying, okay, well, they, they do that and they belong there. And it's yeah. a short space. It's just cheap. Yeah. Um, it's, it's thinking that there's one type of intelligence that's, you know, and what does it even mean somebody's not academic? That's bullshit. You know, you, I mean, you buy your own account, you went on and you got great grades. It's just support yeah, to them develop at different times in different ways. It makes me really cross. But it yeah, is something was, we hear a lot. Yeah, I was a really slow developer as well. So I, I think I, I didn't really come into my own until yeah. my teens, really. Um, and then I ended up getting like crazy grades which i think surprised everyone <laughs> i love that that is brilliant yeah, yeah. it's like a real you know, actually <laughs> do you know but i mean what's incredible as well is and again i'm not sure how um how common your story is in terms of you know you you know you obviously you, you know you talk quite quite passionately about you know that actually you didn't enjoy doing the, the degree it wasn't for you and actually almost that you had like a visceral reaction it wasn't just a like a physical and mental reaction it made you feel ill it wasn't for you you know you talk about that in quite a, a passionate way um and after you know dropping that and then starting to find other stuff but i mean how do you think you were lucky i mean do you think you were lucky was it chance did you get the right person or was it i mean obviously he's incredibly talented but i think there might be people who listen and think oh my goodness me he's you know, he's he didn't do any of the things that you're supposed to do or supposed to do. He didn't go to art school, he didn't do this, and blah 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 blah. He's mm -hmm. you know, he's just walked in, he's rung people up and he's got his work. How amazing, how on earth did he manage that? I mean, is it a combination of you put together a, a bloody good portfolio and you worked hard at it and you were persistent? I mean, what was it do you think that got you that first that first gig? Uh, I think Probably a combination of all of the above, really. Mm. But uh, I remember I phoned up uh, the same magazine and I had a really bad experience on that phone call and they, the person actually hung up on me. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that wasn't what I expected. And then I went away and that really knocked my confidence. And then I thought, no, I'm going to call you back on, this, on a different day next week. And I spoke to the same person and they were like, oh, great, come in. Come was in it the same us. person? Yeah, it was the same oh, person, okay. yeah. So, you know, it, it just goes to show, you know, you can catch somebody on the wrong day. Yeah. Which everybody has a bad day, right, when they're overwhelmed. And the last thing you want is yeah. dealing with, with fuss from other people. Um, I was like, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call back a different day just to make sure maybe that's a bad day for them. Maybe they've got, maybe they're closing the, the issue for the, for the week or whatever. So I called them back on a different day and it was like speaking to somebody totally different. Yeah. And actually when I went to see Wendy, I think I was, I was lucky because Wendy, she really loved hand painted art. And I think there was something about my art, which reminded her of magazines that she used to read when she was younger. When she was little. Yeah. yeah. Some uh, of those, those iconic magazines, those fashion magazines for the 40s exactly. and 50s, you know, yeah. where the women are just <laughs> exquisite. Yeah. And the outfits, yeah. oh yeah, it's a dive yeah. yeah. So, and she really loved the fashion illustrations and art form. So actually, when I went to see her, um, she actually called all the art directors in in the building for me to go and show my portfolio. So you know, so I think it was an element of her just being a, a wonderfully kind and generous person. And, yeah. And and it was so funny because when I actually went to meet her, she didn't ask me where I had studied at all. No, I remember you saying that last time, and I, I think that that's really refreshing to hear. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, I mean, I mean, one thing that we touched on briefly when we spoke a little bit before, and again, it sort of, I, it's a, it's a thread that comes a lot in conversations I have with different people in different, in slightly different um, spheres, but it's this idea, and a lot of it does come back to this idea of, of self-taught artists and. It's sometimes we, we talk about self-taught, sometimes we talk about people who are sort of more labelling themselves as outsider artists, who are perhaps coming from, they know they're really drawing or making outside the mainstream, and it may be that they identify you know, as having, I don't know, neurodiverse or a disability or something, but that, you know, the work is, is sort of being labelled outsider art. But I mean, what you see with some of the work, 
from I think from self talk or outsider art particularly is there's a really there's an absolute unique quality to it um, that I don't think is as easy to get if you come through the system. You know, I mean, I think you know if you're and it's and again, it's not to diss certain art schools all the rest of it. it. It's a really viable route and it's the right thing to do for many people. But you can't help. If you go through that system, there are going to be there's going to be a sort of a a cohort stamp on it when you come out the other end, and it's that almost that sense that when you get out there, you keep the best of what you've learned on the course, but maybe you need to just really lose it and actually restart from the beginning in terms of what you want to do, because otherwise you're yeah. going to be it's all going to look the same. It's all going to be the, it's not going to stand out. It's not going to differentiate. It's not going to catch someone's eye. You know, you want yeah. to be unique and stand out from the yeah. rest. So. I do often feel that and see that in work and you see that there's a fresh take and there's almost a confidence that comes from, from self-taught artists in a way that you don't necessarily yeah. always see. And I wondered what you thought about that. Well, I think, I think the outside of aspect is something that I've thought about a lot. Um, just about my, my history and where, where I'm from. And like, I was born in London, but my parents were Portuguese immigrants. So when I was... They actually met on the boat when they emigrated to London. That's so romantic. That's very really, really <laughs> romantic. Yeah. Yeah. So they met on the boat and then they made a life in 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 London. And like one of the things when you are like uh, first generation British, it's you you occupy this weird middle ground where like mm. you know when you're at school you're like totally British, but then as soon as you go home you you're your your culture is Portuguese, I suppose. I suppose. Mm. My parents really wanted me to speak Portuguese at home so I could communicate with family when they came here on holiday and, and they mm. really wanted to maintain that connection. So it was really funny, when I was in England uh, at school, uh, my friends always used to call me the Portuguese guy, the Portuguese boy. <laughs> and when I used to come here on holidays, I was always the English guy yeah. or the English guy. So you kind of occupy this weird... Yeah. kind of middle mental space where you'd never really that stop never you, quite belonging to one or the other yeah even though I, I feel i feel both you know uh there's parts of me that are so british and parts of me that are really mm. portuguese and so it's kind of this strange middle ground mm. place which is, has a beauty to it as well right there's a couple of um, comments so um Ferrero studio has said fashion illustration at best provides context beyond the obvious and that's the beauty of poss the possibility for us to dream and imagine themselves the style depicted by the artist yeah. and I am Kanye girl that's Sandra um we met the other day totally relate to that because Sandra's um Polish Polish right. so I know that she's expressed that um before too but I mean do you because yeah. obviously you speak Portuguese do you feel that um do you feel that your Portuguese, does it influence your work or your illustration in any way, do you think, in terms of the colour or the style or the line? I was going to say the colour, yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the colour. Um, yeah, I don't know, it's so, so hard to pinpoint these things, you know. But, um, it is, I suppose, because you're just doing it. Oh, it's probably easy to see the outside in, but I was looking at really and wondering whether the palette and the colour choices had any, you know, you were just yeah. being influenced by... Or, and what it was, I suppose, that doesn't the pieces around you when you're doing it. Yeah, I think I think there's definitely something about the light here. And when I when I lived in London, um, so I left London about ten years ago, eleven years ago. Uh, I used to work a lot with gouache, and like everything was the paints were like really thick. And then when I moved here, I started playing with watercolor, where everything's a lot more translucent mm. and a lot more transparent. Uh, so I don't know if that was from you know, just the, the quality of the light is... I was going to say, there's probably a bit more sunshine. Huh? Yeah, so, so <laughs> maybe it kind of reflects that change. Mm. But just going back to what you were saying about not, you know, about going to to college and or to art school and being put through a system and, mm. and that putting a stamp on you, I think maybe I can totally see where that could be a thing because I, I was thinking, you know, Draw, I always saw drawing as as my thing that I was special at. Yeah. And I think if I had been like transplanted into a school where everybody was special <laughs> and everybody had the same skill, that would kind of I think my confidence would have been really knocked from that. So I don't know if I would have, you know, had the same trajectory. Yeah. Had I just stayed in, you know, had I not stayed in my bubble and 
I mean, it's interesting when you're talking, when you're talking about, um, about your confidence and, you know, you're obviously, you you know, as you're a thinker, you know, you're obviously very sensitive and, Mm. but you're obviously very ambitious as well. I mean, you're sort of wanting to get where you want to be. And do you feel, I mean, presumably now where you are at in your career, you feel, no, I am good. I am, you know, you don't feel, you're not thinking, oh, in some ways this isn't real, I'm faking it or this isn't. Yeah, I mean, no, I, you, you, yeah. you feel that confidence now that you've got to the point, surely, where you're confident of your abilities. On, on, yeah, I'm, I'm confident of my abilities, but that's quite a recent thing. Um, I, I think that kind of imposter syndrome never really goes. You know? I used to look at... Yeah, definitely. Well, I used yeah, to that's look so at often. It's so fun. It always comes from the really good, talented people. You never get it from the shit ones. They all think they're good. <laughs> they all think they're good. <laughs> They haven't got any issues. It's always the they not? talented ones. They're a bit like, oh, well, oh, maybe I'm not really, and oh, maybe it's not real, and maybe I'm just imagining it, and maybe I'm not, you know, it's all that. It's, uh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Totally. But just, um, I've kind of been doing a lot of work on myself just to be able to say, I am good. And that that's taken a long time for me to just be able to say, I'm, I'm good at what, what I do. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if that's because of age or, or maybe just working with the people that I work with when, you know, when the editor in chief of Vogue tells you she loves your work and she thinks it's beautiful, that obviously has a psychological impact on you and it kind of gives you permission to be you. Yeah. Which I think is really important. Yeah. Uh, where, whereas I think coming up, I, I spent a, like many, many years battling who I was, creatively speaking, you know, and yeah. kind of trying to suppress certain elements of it because I didn't think they were uh good enough uh, yeah. and so i find those those kind of things that i used to fight and try and suppress i see them now in my work but i see them as as beautiful yeah oh, that, uh, well that's so, wonderful you've well, got to a, that point a, yeah it's a journey you know, yeah it's a journey and it it's is. kind of a it's an ongoing process for them yeah yeah i can i can look at my work and say you know that's good you know but you know I, I still draw enough shit pieces to keep me humble, I think. <laughs> I wow. think, you know, some things, some things end up in the bin and, you know, it's kind of... So I've got so, a few so more I'm questions. Not... I've got a few more things on my <clears throat> sheets. We've got about 23 minutes left. <laughs> accurate. Yeah. Um, so we were talking a bit earlier around, um, you know, the, the, art, the energy and the time that it takes you know, that you put into illustration. And I think, obviously, we're talking about fashion illustration today, but I think you could pick that up and drop it into any conversation with, with a, an illustrator, an artist, who's doing the, doing the work. And what we hear a lot is that people who are commissioning artists don't necessarily always realise, um, you know, just how much time goes into yeah. something. And I suppose I think what I wanted to get, get at is feeds, in a way, Right. fees for artists as something that we hear a lot is and there's, there's lots of campaigns about paying artists uh, appropriately and at the right level and valuing the work and valuing the amount of time and energy that's gone into something you know it's that whole um phrase about you know if somebody somebody <coughs> is commissioned to do somebody and then they they send something but they do it in half an hour and the person says well, why am i paying you all this money if it's taking you half an hour well it's taken me half an hour because i've it's taken me 20 years to get to the yeah. point with my experience where I can do that, do the level and yeah. quality that you want. That's what you're paying for. And it's none of your business whether it takes me half an hour or whether it takes me a week. Um, yeah. but, but I think there's something there about the value of the artist, the illustrator, and about you know the fees that are being offered. Um, so often, certainly at the big draw, we see, or we see people being not treated very well at all in terms of the fees. And, expecting a lot for very little um right. and I, I wondered what your maybe not so much now but maybe a little bit earlier what your experience was of that yeah um i think creators generally are just undervalued aren't they and like one of the things i find really shocking is that like recently i was i was contacted by a, a big magazine to do a, a a piece for them and and the fee that they were wanting to pay me was less than I was 
getting when I first started working like 20 years ago like this is my 20th anniversary as an illustrator and it's yeah. it's kind of crazy I find it really quite mind-boggling how it's just been frozen especially editorially I think prices have been like frozen uh, at that level for for quite a long time mm. well for 20 years basically mm. and uh, I find that quite shocking it's, I think there needs to be like a readjusting in massively I don't, I don't know how that would sorry I think it's a massive issue it's like yes. not just in a necessarily fine art illustration but across mm. the board that um yeah artists are mass undervalued and underpaid yeah. and you know if they they quote the work then there's a sort of oh well, well anybody could do this but well if anybody could do it why are you not doing it yeah, yeah. Know, there is there is a, you know, yeah somebody and said that's such a industry value versus compensation but yeah but it absolutely it shouldn't be I mean, it should be just like anything else um that's your job that's what you do you know yeah. you go in as a transactional sensible must do it it's like do you like it yes lovely this is what it costs done yeah. you know it shouldn't be it shouldn't be it shouldn't be um so uh to be it's, i think yeah. it's a real problem actually yeah it does and there needs to be a readjust but i think that will only happen by having kind of honest conversations about it mm. and, i mean in terms of commissions i mean so when he does commission you um yes do you find that you're given much scope for creativity within the commission or is it often quite rigid? Is it a little bit like, this is what they want, they would like you to, to the nth degree to, or can you, are you, you know, do you find you've got a little bit of scope to play around with the commission? Uh, I have a lot of scope, really, kind of. I've, I've, bizarrely, I found like the bigger the client, the more freedom they give you. Yeah. And, and they kind of like, they really, when they commission you, they commission you to, to present your vision of something you know so they're very hands-off and and kind of sometimes you know you send it in and, and you the only feedback you get is like love exclamation 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 which right. is, really, which is, is that which like is really not it presumably yeah yeah and then yeah and it's kind of a, which is really beautiful um but you know it's, it's kind of, I, I, yeah, I, I have a lot of creative freedom. What, like one of the beautiful things about my relationship with Rogue Portugal is that uh, there are certain things that they'll call me up to do editorially uh, for concepts uh, that they have. But then another side of that is that I get to pitch my own concepts, mm. um, which is like a really amazing luxury, which you don't, which most illustrators don't. No, have. I don't think they do, do they? Um, yeah. It can be quite rigid, I think. Um, yeah. I mean, going back to the sort of the taking the piss thing, I, I, I also hear, I hear quite frequently of, you know, where they will, they will invite, you know, they will basically not just approach somebody to send their idea, but they'll also then commission them to do, to do the artwork, but not pay them. So they expect them to do all of that. And then they'll just say, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get you all to do it. And then, you know what, we'll just choose which one we like best rather than actually making a decision at the beginning. Yeah. Right. So that's another thing. Yeah. That, the competition thing yeah the competition I've, I've seen, <laughs> yeah I've, I've seen like major brands yeah kind of, i've seen it it's shocking and it's, it's it's yeah it's a little bit sad because you know obviously younger people want the opportunity to do it you know to, to yeah have a, a, well, it's that whole thing i've even seen i've seen the word of them. it says things like so um Obviously, we're not going to pay you. You're not going to get any expenses or anything. But hey, you know, you're going to be so lucky for the privilege of working with us and our amazing brand. That's what you get. Just the experience of being in the same room with us. And it's yeah. like, really? You know, yeah, it, yeah no, it's, it's really shocking. It's Sandra's yeah, just texted me some questions that I've missed as they've popped up. So shall I ask a few of those? So the first one is, what are Nuno's biggest influences in his art? So I know you've touched on some of them. Um, the artists that you, you love um but yes do you have some more influences you'd like to uh i love fashion photographers uh so one of uh one of my passions is uh fashion magazines so i have a huge collection of magazines and and i really just love seeing the evolution of uh photographers like avadon myself pen 
like all, all the greats. Uh, and so they're, they're a huge inspiration, but not necessarily in the form of, you know, when I take inspiration from things, it's not like I see an image, I want to replicate it, or I see an image, I want to draw like they photograph. It's not really about no. that. I'm inspired by, by different things in their work. And like one of the key things I really love about them is about all those photographers that I named is that uh, how they approach their art form and, and, and kind of they, you know, you could give them any topic from like the grimiest, grungiest thing. Mm. You know, Avedon traveled through America and he photographed hillbillies and, and you know, he, he photographed people from the deep south and people without teeth. And, mm. and then he could do a, a couture shoot with like a hundred thousand pound dresses. And yeah, and it was always him, do you know? authentic it's authentic it's, it's yeah definitely authentic and it always felt like him you could tell it was him photographing and that's kind of something i i hope i do with my work is you know it doesn't you know you can give me topics to draw like you know vogue will give me various topics to draw which are kind of uh not chosen by me and it's my job to be able to do them beautifully and mm. do them justice mm. but for it to still feel like me mm. um, and that's something I really kind of that really inspires me about those photographers like Stephen Mizell as well you know he, he could photograph models in a in a squat and find the beauty in it mm. and then he could photograph you know the same women in control dresses and, and it, it was always my, it's always myself you know um, yeah and, and that's something that really really inspires me and um there's another question I've got one here, yes, which is um drawing tips basically in terms of if, if somebody really did want it's a very big question actually if somebody was interested in getting it started in fashion illustration do you have any advice it's quite a big a big one. Oh, <laughs> I know. I'm they didn't ask me that <laughs> that's quite a big wow. question what would I say? Gosh. Do you know? Oh gosh, I don't know. It's such a, it's such a, I would say practice, practice, practice. Something that I say a lot is, you know, like fashion illustrators, to be a good fashion illustrator, you've got to treat yourself as an Olympic athlete treats their craft. Do you know, when you open up a, a fashion magazine and you see our work in it, or if you see it on a billboard in a shop window, that's the equivalent of a, an Olympic mm. gymnast on the mat in front of the judges. You know, but before you get to open up the magazine, do you know, there's days and years and hours upon hours of practice. Mm. And, and they, and just that that, they just see the end game, don't they? They don't see any of the, the flaws before that. You know, and part, part, of, part of that practice means you fall on your face sometimes. You know, like the athlete isn't always able to do the, the triple jump or the, or the vault, mm. you know. Inevitably, they will have fo fallen and hurt themselves along the way. And, and you know, you Yeah, know. and being allowed to make mistakes. And there's something around that playfulness and being allowed to make mistakes. Because actually, mm. it's quite a child, a, a kiddie thing, actually. And I think we grow out of it, unfortunately, as adults. Mm. But... That whole thing around, you know, playing around with something and an idea, and it sort of goes wrong, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. And instead of ending, you know, from A, B, C, maybe you go from A to F or something, but you're ending up with yes. something that's maybe more, far more interesting or quirky or just a bit more, you know, a bit more interesting. Um, yeah. I really like yeah. that idea of playfulness and playing around when it's, it's, it's external, it might be a mistake, but it's actually, it's the imagination, it's the imag process of the imagination and, and conceiving new new ideas Def there has to be that, that in there you have to i don't think society enough at the moment to get on my high horse i don't think at the moment we're, we're almost not given permission to make mistakes as much yes in this yeah. in our i think at the moment and that, not just with kids but i think as grown-ups uh, as well yeah. there's something around definitely. definitely and i think as well you know you look at our work on instagram and you only ever you only ever see the best of us you know you, you don't see our mistakes when we we, it's like when we have to work. nobody shows that. Yeah. It's like so it's kind of, yeah. So 
you know, it's all about practice, 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 and mm. dedication, and and allowing yourself to make mistakes, and knowing that, you know, if you're not making mistakes, it means you're not taking risks in your work. And I think take, Which is taking risks, yeah. risks, yeah. And yeah. oh, another thing I would say is that people confuse uh, style uh, with technique, and then not the same thing, you know. I could use a ballpoint pen and it will still feel like me. Yeah. Uh, so don't get so hung up on my style is watercolor. My style is uh, charcoal. You know, that's, that's not what your style is. Your style is your essence and your spirit. And that's, and the rest is just the tool. And the rest is the tool. Yeah. So, mm. um, you know, so don't confuse the two. So it, don't let that hold you back from trying new things. I think experimentation is key. That's one of the things that, kind of keeps my work kind of fresh, you know, it's, it's, um, mm -hmm. I, I, I like that people don't necessarily know what they're going to get from me the next time, but they, it will always be me. Um, you know, I've just done a, a 10 page story with a friend of mine who's a hairstylist and we did a beauty story for Vogue Portugal. Um, and it was kind of inspired by Richard Avedon, but, uh, but he did a shoot in the 60s called The Twig in the Tree. Okay. And have you seen it? I haven't seen it, but I love anything from the 60s stuff. I think I should have lived in it. Yeah. See, that, that was the thing that really inspired me. It's a really beautiful shoot, Penelope Tree in Twiggy. And kind of initially when I'd spoken to my friend, Neil Moody, who did the hair for the story, uh, I was explaining the concept and I was thinking, oh, maybe we can do a 1960s eye and whatever. And then it struck me that actually when Avedon was creating that story, he was never ever looking backwards. He was always looking to the future and that he was creating his own vision of what the future was, um, you know, and he was experimenting. And I think you know, that's, that's so key, you know, just keep on experimenting and keep on pushing yourself and, and, and kind of, yeah. so we created something totally fresh and kind of that pushed my work forward and, and Neil created this fantastic hair for it. And uh, and I think people, it would have been something that my people who like my work maybe would not have expected. And I, uh, I like that, you know, being, yeah. would have, it still feels Keep like me. Yeah. I think it keeps things interesting, you know. It does. And for you as well. Definitely. There's been quite a few questions throughout yeah. around digital and analog. Right. So right. I suppose the idea of because I know you use both in different ways. So there's been some direct questions like the one about you know, an iPad. So I suppose the one I'm thinking of, um, you know, iPad Pro. I mean, I, we've got Procreate at use. I use it all the time. My kids use it. I mean, the, the Apple Pencil. There are some incredible tools out there now. I, mean, yes. I, I personally don't feel that it replaces. I think that they, it, you know, they, it doesn't have to be either or. It can absolutely be both together. But there's been yeah, a few, quite a few questions around, around, how that works for you within your own work, but what you really think about it? Uh, I don't use iPads. Uh, I do. I just well, you know, I use it for Google. <laughs> I, can't, yeah. I can't draw it. <laughs> but uh, I so I draw by hand and then I scan and I retouch. Yeah. So like beauty images. Uh, actually, the, the story that I did with Neil uh, was retouched uh, because it we sent them off to a, a makeup artist so she could consult on the makeup. And generally when I paint, uh, I use stains to indicate forms of shape uh, of eyes and cheeks and whatever. But yeah. when you work with makeup artists, they take those stains very literally uh, and they assume that they're makeup. So I cleaned off all the, <laughs> all the stains. That really, so that the makeup, that's really yeah. funny. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they're, they're very kind of, you know, uh, one of them I actually didn't clean off and, and I just indicated the eyes with a uh, stain and she was like, oh, it looks like she's got violet makeup on and and that wasn't my intention when I painted it, you know, I was just indicating the, the shape. So that mm. was kind of really cleaned up uh, yeah. so that she could have a blank canvas to, to just, you know, let her... Her own creativity influence. makeup, you know, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, but I, I think there aren't really any rules nowadays. I don't think, you know. No, no. I mean, I, I, I think it's a, I think it's a tool. I mean, I always think about it being as a good tool, digital. I mean, it, 
I get asked it a lot because of the big draw things like, oh, do you think digital drawing is bad for kids? Well, of course I don't think it's bad for kids. I think if they're drawing, they're drawing. You know, if they're making yeah. marks with meaning and they're being imaginative and they're doing something with their hands, they're conveying message and all the rest of it and they're having fun and it's playful. Well, you know, whether they're drawing with chalk, whether they're drawing with an iPad pencil, whether they're mm. drawing with clay, I don't think it, it necessarily matters. It was just what you were saying earlier. It's, they're just different, aren't they? Yeah. It's the imagination yeah. and um, the yeah. person, the personality that I guess is the intention and the tools deliver the yeah. intention. Yeah. Uh, my, my issue with the iPad is that it's just too small for me. I, I draw quite big. Uh, I can draw, you know, like A2 size yeah. or A3 size. And, and, kind of, and, I, and I like the sensation of the paper. Yeah. Um, I know artists, some, some friends, well, they... They get um, like that's the, almost like kitchen grease proof paper, and they they sellotape sandwiches on the ice, and they they do it through the paper. Obviously, you still get this. Well, because you, it, it 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 you get the, the texture as off that's oh, slight. Okay. What's the word? You know, it just doesn't. It, there's a bit of friction. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just does. It slightly changes the. Which, and I know it's funny because I know I've had tried to replicate all of these things on it, but I guess I haven't quite got there with it. Yeah, but, uh, uh, there's a little skin you can put on the, on the screen. I'm sure there is. I, I know quite a few people that say that they much prefer just a bit of old kitchen grease proof paper, but, you know, it's, wow. uh, whatever, uh, whatever works, I suppose. I mean, the other yeah. question that's been asked a few times is, and it's something everybody always wants to ask any of the illustrators or the artists or the people that we, we speak to, which is, are you willing to share any of that's around particular material, go to paper suppliers, pencils, pens, paper, do you have any preferences or do you really, does it really not matter? I'm actually like, I'm still in mourning that my favourite paper stock oh, was wow. taken off the market. Which paper, <laughs> which paper is it? It was a uh, Cancer Moulin de Roy, which is a uh, really beautiful watercolour paper. Uh, it was getting like really expensive um, right. you know, to buy fun. anyway, but then they just stopped producing it. Uh, so now I use Arches, which is uh, a really good paper. And because uh, I use quite a lot of water on my paper. Yeah. So I kind of stretch it. So it needs to be really, really lovely quality, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of a cotton paper and it's like 300 grams and yeah. it can take the water and, and I mean, I sticky tape it to a board and paint on that. And then I use Winsor & Newton. I use, who else do I use? Karen Dash pencils. So I use a whole mix of things in my work. And then I scan and Photoshop and clean up and yeah. jazz things up a bit when necessary. <laughs> when necessary, yeah. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't think there are any rules anymore. You know, People can... No. Yeah. It's, it's about the feeling. I mean, there's so much choice, isn't there, as well? Um, yeah. Well, I suppose I've got, before we, we've got about five minutes left, I mean, I, I have two, just two questions, I suppose, left in my head. And I think the first one is, you know, you know, when I talk to you, you know, you talk about when you were younger and your experiences and all the rest of it. You know, you are, you know, you're very passionate, um, very articulate about, you know, how... You know, your journey wasn't a linear one, and there's lots of kids out there that will have similar, unfortunately, experiences where they're not necessarily getting the support they need. And I don't know. I think I think you're making an amazing role model. And I just wondered, you know, would you? I mean, can you imagine yourself talking to kids and saying, "Do you know what? I did this. This is what I did. This is a viable. It's what you said. It's a viable career option." You know, I didn't yeah. do it this, I did it and I wanted to do it and I kept trying and I was passionate and I worked hard and I've done it my way and you can make yeah. money out of this. This is a viable, don't believe the hype, don't believe the, better yeah. not say too much about the government, don't believe the propaganda. You know, there is wonderful, creative, amazing, viable, real jobs out there for kids and I just, yeah. I don't know, I think you've been an amazing champion and uh, as a, someone to go and talk to them, I just wondered what, what you thought about that. I think that's beautiful. I don't know if I deserve that, but um, yeah, I'm always kind of a bit nervous about, you it's know, it's such fine. a big responsibility, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, 
it is a big responsibility. So I just wanted to plant a seed there, really. Yeah, no, I definitely, I would, I would love that. I mean, that was uh, one thing. Oh, yeah, so there we go. And I agree with this. Uh, are you interested in teaching? I think it would be fabulous and highly sought out. Yeah, you could do some mm -hmm. master classes, couldn't you? Master classes, but master classes for kids who have been overlooked, you know, because yeah. they haven't, you know, they're not in with the, the rich kids that are all going to X, Y, and Z and are getting everything. Um, so, I mean, you know, there was all the... that was swirling around my head a bit. And I suppose the question for me, I was thinking just maybe to round off on was, you know, you've achieved so much already, you know, what's next for you? You know, is it more of the same? Is there something you sort of got your eye on that you're hoping to, have you got any secrets that you'd like to share with us that you want to tell us about your next big oh, thing? I, yeah, I've got lots of things planned, but you know. Nothing that you can tell us at the moment. Well, kind of, I, um, I just, really reticent about sharing things until they're done <laughs> of course no i'm no i'm terrible no. because i'm just like oh tell me your secrets no it's, <laughs> it's, like, just, it's, just, it's just you never know what's gonna what's gonna you know i, I never count my my chickens no is that the same it's it's just uh you know life has been i've been really fortunate and, and blessed to do some amazing things and Sandra's you know just said, Sandra's just said, I await a fashion illustration animation from you now. Oh, Maybe yeah. you know something I've, we don't know. I don't know. I've, I've been thinking a lot about animation lately, and I think that's kind of going to be a, a, a key tool for people moving forwards, for illustrators moving forwards. I think I think that's going to be pretty inescapable. Yeah. Um, so I might have to buy an iPad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, keep in, yeah. <laughs> start learning animation but uh yeah I, i've got I've, yeah i think that would be really lovely and um kind of bringing my my work to life in a really in a kind fun. of new way would be really beautiful i think be we've really just got a couple of minutes left before we need to round off was there anything that you wanted to say before we before we finish just i'd like to reiterate that the comments about practicing and, and kind of to be kind to yourself in your process and to not judge yourself too harshly and you know unless you are making mistakes that means you know if you if you do want to achieve you're gonna have to trial and error and make mistakes and, and and you know that's that's just the nature of it so just be kind to yourself when you do and and, and you know if you're not making those mistakes it means you're just doing what you've always done and that means you're you're not growing you know, if you don't feel that discomfort and the friction, yeah, it means yeah, you're, you need to feel that completely. And kind of, and also as well, when I've been through those difficult times creatively, that's, and I come out the other end, that's when I have my biggest growth spurts. You know, that's when I, my work just, you know, is, just good. advances in, in years. Yeah. Uh, and it's kind of right after I've had that dip of thinking I'm the worst artist in the world. And that should just give up and. I mean, I, if, if I may, I'd like to add something like to that, what you were just saying around, you know, sort of pushing through and out of the comfort zones and you know, it's almost like doing exposure therapy or something and doing it anyway. But um, I think that it, it's about kind to yourself. But I think also, and I think, again, I think it's a thing you just do more of as, as you get older. It's the basic it's so sense. But just don't surround yourself by horrible people. It's so simple. Yes. But, you know, just, you know, make sure that you're... You know, don't feel that you have to somehow make that work with some really vile person that is just draining and energy sapping and horrible and insulting and all the rest of it. Um, no, no, you don't. You just don't bother with them and you move along. And I think, I mean, I, mean, I certainly used to, when I was a lot younger, I used to think, oh, I, I have to somehow. And I think as you get older, you just think, oh, I don't. Why am I even bothering? It doesn't. Yeah, it's, it's really damaging and it's just drains energy. And, you know, when you could be surrounding yourself you know, positive, Definitely. kind people who are on the same page as you, who are, who are creative and think in a similar way. And it's, it's empowering and it's, it gives you energy. Indeed. And sometimes that horrible person lives inside our minds. So it's about switching off that horrible voice yeah. that tells you you're no good, you know, and just powering through. Yeah. And kind of like learning to monitor your internal dialogue and, and changing the, the negative words into kinder words. Yeah. Saying that yourself, you know, and others as well. Yeah, but no, I think you know sure. we are very often our very own worst critics, and and people don't judge us as harshly as we judge ourselves. So always, I think always, that's, always. That's, yeah, that's a learning process. You know? It is. So be kind. 
Be kind. Just, I think that's a lovely one to finish on. Be kind. Yeah. Be kind and yeah. keep drawing. Yes, and keep drawing. <laughs> yeah. And I would love, I mean, I've had a lovely time. I could chat with you all day. It's incredibly compelling to talk to you. I'd love to talk more about it. I love fashion. I love colour. I love all of it. I'm so jealous of you. Um, it's so nice to talk to you. And I don't know, maybe we can do another one, you know, if you want to. Love. You know, when, you, when you've got that next big secret project that you haven't told us about yet, um, yes. maybe we can do another one then. But I hope everyone's in, enjoyed it that stayed on the call. We'll, we'll be lifting it. We'll be putting it on the usual, onto YouTube. Obviously, it'll stay on Instagram Live. But we will lift it and put it onto YouTube as an asset as well. And we'll share it on social media. And we'll put it in our newsletter so it'll be all over the place. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Lovely you are anyway you. already. You already are. Oh, thank you so much for your time. Such a pleasure thank to you. talk to you, and you take care, and I hope to speak to you soon. You too, and thank you for everybody for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye.